Please turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're going to be um, looking at this story um, about the Good Samaritan. I want to begin with a story. I was about 13, anywhere from 13 to, to 15. Let's just say I was 14. And so uh, my cousin visited from Arizona, and he had an, un- an uncle named Bert, Uncle Bert. And now Uncle Bert had this three-story uh, three story house in Braintree. And my cousin contracted to paint the house. And he asked me to help. I had no idea what I was getting into. So I said, yes. I mean, like any teenager, they're just so ready and willing to work to make money, right? Yeah. Um, so there I was, and uh, we were painting this gigantic house with like dark brown oil based paint, which is like molasses, in the humidity, in the, in the heat of summer with yellow trim. Remember those days? Brown houses with yellow trim way back when. I don't know if anybody, anybody from Braintree or Weymouth or something like that. We had a lot lot of houses like that. So anyways, I mean, it's, I'm making money. I'm painting. Every day's an adventure. We're scraping. We're sanding. We're making this house look beautiful. And then my cousin, he's smart. He saw me as the grunt, the grunt laborer. And he, there was a section now, three stories up. You had to first take a 40 foot ladder, lean it up against the roof, then climb the roof to get to this higher place where the, um, where the dormer was. So the dormer is up there. So he says, Neil, I want you to do that job. I've never climbed a ladder, never climbed a roof like this. And so I said, I'm all in. I was excited. You should have seen me. You should have seen me. There I go, bounding up the 40-foot ladder, extended all the way to the top of the second floor where I'm going to reach up to the third story, climbing a very steep pitch roof to get to the dormer, which basically hangs over three stories down as I'm looking down. And I get there and it's just like, man, just like a superhero. I feel like I'm Spider-Man. I can climb. I've got all these buckets in my hand. And I'm like, this is amazing. I'm a man. I'm a manly man. Get up there and I do the work and I paint the thing. And now I have to get down. I started to approach my descent and I got terrified. I was so scared. I was shaking. I didn't know how to get down. I went from a manly man to the biggest wuss in Braintree. <laughs> and so I didn't know what to do. And uh, my cousin's yelling up, just, just start to walk backwards. And I'm like, I, I can't even move. I'm paralyzed. And so everyone's given me coaching from, from down there. And I didn't know what to do. So now I'm like, everybody's coming out of their houses and looking at this obstacle of of a wimp uh, on a roof. And so after some time, the fireman who lived across the street had to come up and rescue me and get me down off of that roof. And all of my dignity was lost, completely gone. I no longer felt like a man. I felt more like a mouse. But I just want to tell you, I restored my dignity because I went to higher heights later I was mounting higher roofs, and I certainly regained my manhood. Anyways, are you happy about that? But, <laughs> um, anyways, I, I was so grateful, even though I was humiliated, that he risked his life to save this young teenage boy that was terrified. <laughs> if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here today. It would have been a whole different story. How many, how many of you have been in situations where you had to depend on somebody else who was smarter than you, stronger than you, healthier than you, whatever than you, and if it weren't for them, and you just, you just are so grateful that there was a time and a day where somebody, whether you were in a, 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 an emotional place or you were in a physical place or you were in some kind of place where somebody was willing to come and enter your world and help you to get to where you needed to be. Anybody like that? Now, how many of you would like to be that person that rescues, that can be there and be the hero like me on my way up to the roof, right? Uh, we, all, we all think of stories like that. We all, we all want to be in a story like that. Well, this, is a real, this is, well, this isn't a real story. It's a parable that Jesus made up of the good Samaritan. So, and what we're going to find out from the story is four things. Because Jesus attaches this story to a question that is asked by a Jewish lawyer, a biblical lawyer. He knows the law. 
And he wants to know what must I do to, to have eternal life. Same question Nicodemus asked. Same question the rich young ruler asked. And um, Jesus is so smart because he always asks a question with a question. He answers a question with a question. And by the way, he's being trapped. So the best way to get out of a trap is to answer with a question. So Jesus is the master at that. So um, we're going to read this um, in a minute. But here's the track that we're going to follow. You ready? Everybody ready? Balcony people? You ready here on the floor? Um, so this answers the question. Um, well, this, this basically is, is the kind of map on which we're going to go. Number one, what do eternal life people do? So the, the point is he wants to know how to get eternal life. And so Jesus is going to answer the question. Actually, he's going to answer his own question, and Jesus is going to help him answer it with a story. What do eternal life people do? Let's call them ELs. Are you an EL? Do you have eternal life? Right? What do eternal life people do? Second, what makes eternal life impossible? You're going, what? Just hang on. Number three, what makes eternal life a reality? And number four, all of this makes radical love possible. That's the track we're going to follow. So let's, let's, um, let's go to the first point, what do eternal life people do? And let's read the passage. Okay, are you ready? Open in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, Jesus, to the test. All of these Pharisees and teachers of the law and all of the scribes, these people are always trying to put Jesus to the test because he's gaining the multitudes. He's gaining the crowds. People are attracted to him because he's nothing like the religious leaders of their day. And so um, he is just emanating love. So he, they, they want to try to sabotage his work and they, it never works really. So he, teacher, what shall I do? to inherit eternal life. Now, probably what this guy expects is that because Jesus is a friend of sinners and he shows so much grace and love, he probably expects that Jesus will not validate that we should all live according to the moral law. But Jesus doesn't do that. He's thinking, you know, he's just going to say you can live however you want. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus asked him this question, verse 26. He said to him, what is written in the law how do you read it? What is written in the law? Now, he's a biblical lawyer, so he knows biblical law. How do you read it? So Jesus is basically going to get him to answer his own question. He's going he's to see if he practices what he preaches. You with me? And then he answered, verse 27, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, let's emphasize all, <laughs> and with all your strength and with all your mind, this is how you get eternal life, and love your neighbor as yourself. How do we love our neighbor? Just like we love ourselves. We love God comprehensively. We love our neighbor just like we love ourselves. Verse 28, and he said to them, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So this guy answers with the law. This is how you get eternal life. Jesus said, do this and you will live. So the emphasis is on eternal life, right? And then um, just take a, a pause. Hold your thought right there. The reason we've gone to the Good Samaritan story is because we're in this series, as I said, called You Are Loved. And what we want to do this summer, what we're doing, and don't forget this, please, is that we have learned how loved we are. Jesus commissioned us, and by the way, you can see in Luke chapter 10 in the beginning, he sends them out to be messengers, to go declare, right? Declare the gospel. We must, all of us as believers, we're all called to declare the gospel. We need to tell the story. We need to actually use our lips, our vocal cords, to tell people so that they can know this beautiful gospel. But see, we don't just declare the gospel. We demonstrate the gospel. So now Jesus spent many verses talking about how we should be messengers. But now he's going to teach us how to be a neighbor. How to really 
tangibly demonstrate the love of Jesus. Do you get that? Okay, let's go back now to the scripture. Verse 29. Now this is the lawyer. But he desiring to what? This is important. What, what, he, he desiring to what? Justify himself, said to Jesus. That's key. Desiring to justify himself. I have to stop there for a minute. Because Jesus all along has been telling the multitudes, the disciples, you need me. <laughs> the, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. You need me. Whoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. So he's been telling that. But all of these people do, were doing what a lot of people today do. They're resisting, pushing back. They don't want Jesus. Have you, have you met those people? Resisting, pushing back. They don't want Jesus. Right? So um, he's trying to justify himself because without Jesus, can I just tell you, without Jesus, when you die and you go to face Christ, if you don't come under the grace that he provided, if you haven't trusted him and his sacrifice, if you shunned um, his radical love and radical mercy for you, then you have to demonstrate that you have lived a life that's been impeccable and that you're worthy of being in the presence of a holy, powerful, almighty, righteous, just king. You're going to have to prove that. If you, just, if you reject the love of Jesus, the grace, the, all of that, you're going to have to prove that. So what you're... And, and a lot of people are, try, are resisting Jesus and saying, I, I'm justifying myself. I think I'm good enough. I think I don't need to be a Christ follower. I think that I've done enough good works that I can stand before God. The problem is the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not, not one single one. <laughs> no, nobody is righteous enough to be in the presence of God. Okay, just hold that thought. So let's go back to this. But he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So now he wants to get technical, right? Because when he quoted the law, Jesus said, if you want eternal life, you have to do all this. He's, like all of us, we're going, wait, have I loved the Lord oh my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my might, with all my strength? All the time? Anybody here have done that your whole life? You've never missed a ma Okay, thank you. We're with a bunch of honest people. Okay, second, have I, can I check this box? Have I loved my neighbor as myself? In other words, do I care for them like I care for myself? Do I think about their needs like I think about my needs? Do I spend money on them like I would spend? Do I? I think we probably all fail that test. Now, do we do some of that? Absolutely. But Jesus is saying, if you want eternal life this way, if you want to have eternal life according to your own works, then do all these things and you live. And what Jesus is doing on purpose is creating a conundrum for him. Because he's thinking about what he said, his own answer, is I know how to get eternal life. You do all these things and... Jesus said, that's right, you do all those things comprehensively and you will live. Now, if you're like me, you're reading this going, if you don't understand the passage, what the real message is, you're going, I am in trouble. I remember that there is somebody I should have loved better. I didn't. In fact, I was terrible. Or uh, I remember that when I should have loved God with my mind, I allowed a thought that was wicked. I know none of you have ever had that problem before, right? Just every thought is pure and just white as snow. Every, everybody, right? No, no, no. You're, if you're going to just be on the same page, you'll say, Pastor, I, I know what you're talking about. So um, I haven't done these things. So he's sitting there trying to think. Well, he's actually filled with pride because he's self-deceived. He thinks that he's pretty good, you know. But he, he gets him on the neighbor thing. He gets himself on the neighbor thing. Jesus traps him. He's trying to... He's trying to trap Jesus. Jesus traps him. And he's going, okay, give me the definition of neighbor. Because it was, you could tell, you know it was troubling him. Who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus doesn't answer 
with a speech, he answers with a story. Are you ready? Are you ready for the story? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now the man, in some translations say a Jewish man, and so he's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. So I want to tell you about this story. Uh, I want to tell you about the road. Everybody say road. Let me tell you about the road. You can go there today and find that road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a dangerous road. It's windy. It's got cliffs. But back in that day, and even still, it can be dangerous in terms of it was actually nicknamed um, uh, the, the pass of blood. Why? Because people got killed on that road. Have you seen um, what was on the news today? You know Methadone Mile? It's in Boston. It's where so many of the drug addicts hang out, and there's been a lot of violence there. It's kind of like the Methadone Mile of that day. Uh, they had to break it up this week. The police are trying to move people from that place because of the violence and the fighting and all that's going on. Well, imagine now, this road was like, like that, only worse. People were dying on a regular basis. So Jesus is telling us the story that they're all well aware of. This road, blood pass, this is where this man is walking. Now, what happens to him? He fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him what? Leaving him what? Half dead. Now by, by chance, a priest was going down. Oh, good, good, good. A priest is coming. A priest is coming to the rescue. A man of God. And where he teaches others that you have to love the stranger. You have to help the sick and the wounded. So good, a priest is coming. Everybody feel good about this? A priest is coming. Down that, that same road. And when he saw him, what did he do? He passed by on the other side. This is a man of God. A man of the cloth. So likewise, a Levite. Oh, he's coming. Good, a Levite. Well, what's a Levite? A Levite is somebody who worked on the temple. So he's a man of God, and he's going to do something about this terrible injustice. He's going to come to the rescue. Oh, good, maybe the, the Levite, he'll be the hero. How many of you think he's going to be the hero? You're like, Pastor, we know this story. Come on, get over it. Let's go. Uh, Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by to the other side. Now you've got two supposedly godly men who were supposed to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, strength. And in doing so, by loving God, they're supposed to love their neighbor as yourself. And that, by the way, according to the law, according to what, what, what it said, that is the criteria to get eternal life. So what do we, we come, we realize something. They don't have eternal life. If they're trusting in the law to get saved, I just want to tell you something to relieve some of you at this point. Jesus isn't saying the law is the way to life. He's saying it's a way of life. This moral law isn't the way to life, it's the way of life. And I shouldn't have probably said that too early, too soon. But that's okay. Now, Jesus tells a story, they, this one passed by, but 33, verse 3, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, which oil is a soothing agent, and wine is an antiseptic. And so he's, he's, he goes ahead and he, he does all that, and then he set him on his own donkey, animal, probably a donkey, a beast of burden, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. This guy's going all out. And then the next day, which means if it's the next day, that means he spent the night with him. So he's there with him. He's spending time with him. He's letting him, he's putting him on, on a saddle that he belongs to. He's spending time. And then it says, um, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, everybody say two denarii. Now, archaeologists have uncovered some proof that shows us mathematically that it was one thirty-second of a denarii would pay for one night at a, at a hotel. And by the way, you're not talking Marriott. You're not talking a hotel like that. But one thirty-second of a denarii. So uh, do the math. How, how long? This guy was willing to put him up for a very long time. Two denarii. 
So he's really going all out. And then Jesus says something. He, he, he turns it around and he says, which of these three, speaking to the Jewish man now, do you think proved to be a neighbor? First, the guy's asking, who is my neighbor? Hoping that he can get an answer because he wants this neighbor thing to be limited. The people that I love, my family, you know, people that do good to me, right? We want to see this in light of a limited spectrum, not a broad spectrum. Are you with me? Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So I want to break this down, and we're going to do it as quick as possible. And I want to ask this question. Are you ready? What do eternal lifers, eternal life people do? That's the first thing that we want to see what Jesus what his expectation is for those who are Christ followers or those who back then were the, the Jewish people who were called to be a city on the hill, they were supposed to represent Jesus to the world. What, what are we, what are they supposed to look like? Let's break it down. A Jesus kind of neighbor, let's look at these three things. A Jesus kind of neighbor, number one, number one, sees others as valuable as yourself or as themselves. We see the, the key here. Have you, did you notice every time somebody came down that road, they saw him. They saw the guy in his horrible, stripped, beaten, destitute situation. So the, the priest goes, he sees him, but he goes to the other side. The Levite comes, he sees him but he goes to the other side. So what do we learn in this? How do we, like how is this relevant to us in 2019? God wants us to have the kind of eyes that see people that when you look deeply enough, you allow that vision of what you see to kind of, um, for, for it to come and enter your heart. To enter your mind. You see, we, we try to protect ourselves, don't we? Because when I see somebody in need, the first thing I do is I want to be careful because if I see too much, if I, if I contemplate too long, I might have to take action or I have to live with my guilt. So how many of you have like, you like saw it, but you, you didn't see it? I, di I didn't see that. Because it means that I should do something but I've got too many other things to do for my life. I've got to earn wealth. I've got to make money. I've got a busy life. I can't be bothered. And Jesus comes against and wrecks that mindset <laughs> by telling this story. Now then, not only that, but the one who is the hero, can I tell you about him? Samaritan. He's, now Jesus is speaking to a Jew. He's actually evangelizing this Jew because he wants him to come to a place to realize he's, a, he's the guy on the road. So he, he, what he does is he, he uses such an ironic story. The Jews hate the Samaritans. They're absolutely prejudiced against the Samaritans. They're basic, like, I'm not saying all Jews. I'm saying in this time, it was, it was pretty, pretty uh, normal for a Jew to look down upon a Samaritan. Why? Why? Because they lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. And in their past, in their history, when, when the Assyrians, when the Babylonians came and the, they had the big exile and the Babylonians and the Assyrians moved in over the, those historical years, the Jewish people would, would marry the Gentile people, whether Assyrian or Babylon. And then the Jews said they're half-breeds they're not worthy of honor. We refuse to look at them as valuable as we see ourselves. And how many of you know Jesus breaks those cultural norms? How many of you are grateful that Jesus came and where there was prejudice, where there was racism, where was any, Jesus came and just drove a, tr a Mack truck right through that, that philosophy, that mindset. Amen? So how do we know that? The Jews would avoid going to Samaria. Why? Because in their past, 
the Samaritans, as they became a people, what they would do is they were an enemy to Israel. They would, when they tried to build the temple, they came against it. There was all this history. And so the Jews developed a very cold heart for the, the Samaritans. So they wouldn't have anything to do with them. Jesus is going up to Galilee and where they would normally avoid Samaria, Jesus goes right through it and he has it. The object of his love is this, this uh, woman at the well who he wants to give the gospel to. He spends time with one, this one woman. She had been with five guys. She goes from man, she was married to five men, man to man to man to man. She's got a problem. And then the guy that she was with, she was living with, she was in sin. Jesus comes right beside her and starts to minister life to her, L loves her, doesn't judge her. He wants her to know that he, 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 he sees her as valuable. He looks at her with value. So Jesus totally destroys these cultural norms. And now he tells a story using the Samaritan. And the Samaritan, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came along and he had compassion. That's, that's amazing. So he would see, he saw the value in a Jew who had prejudice against him. You see, listen, I'm going to tell you, we live in a time where the enemy is stirring up racial animosity and division. And I'm going to tell you, if we're Christians, we will say we're, gonna, we're just going to carry the torch strong. We're going to show each other that, no, that there is zero racism in Christianity. We're going to love people no matter what color, what culture, what background. We're going to love them like Jesus. We're going to take the lead. We're not going to be divided over, over politics and let stupid... Um, divisions come because somebody's on the other side of the political aisle. Rubbish. If you're Democrat, you got to love the Republicans. If you're a Republican, you got to love the Democrat the way that Jesus was. And we got to stop seeing people as the other, those people. We got to be like this good Samaritan. Uh, Jesus' kind of neighbor serves others like you'd need to be served. I mean, I would look and say there's needs there, and Jesus is really challenging with this story because he's basically saying this Samaritan did, hey, can I ask a question? Did he owe that Jewish guy anything? Would it be normal and natural for him to want to go? No, 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 he goes and he just loves this guy. He serves him the way that he would want to be treated. How many of you have ever heard the golden rule or the royal law of love? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the other thing that Jesus' kind of neighbor does is shares generously as though it was for your own benefit. Share with others generously as though it was for your own benefit. In fact, we call this holistic ministry. Everybody say holistic ministry. And that is the kind of ministry where we will share, we will, we will meet physical, medical, financial needs in the love of Jesus. We will... We will like spend and, and, and even if it means that it leaves us uh, in, in some, somewhat of a less wealthy place, that we would, we would absolutely go out all in, in the royal law of love. Could you please turn, go left in your Bibles in the gospel to Matthew 25? Would you do that? Please go to Matthew 25. Jesus teaches this thing about in the last days when he comes back about the separation of the sheep and the goat and you know we're supposed to allow his teachings to really strike us to the heart right so be prepared for this Jesus chapter 25 Matthew 31 when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne verse 32 therefore uh, before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you when you were... And when you were thirsty, give you a drink. And when did we see a stranger and welcome you and naked and clothe you? And when, when did we see you sick or in prison? When, Jesus? 
And the king will answer him, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Wow. Now, how about the other side, the goats, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire. This is Jesus. Prepared for the devil and his angels. The eternal fire was never prepared for us. Ever. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked. You did not clothe me sick. You did, and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Jesus taught this. Jesus and you're, it, it's meant to be troubling. <laughs> this is probably not a refrigerator scripture. It's meant for us to think. Think. Absorb this. And then we go, oh, like, now your, your natural mind, your ungospeled mind, would say, this is how we get saved. I have to do all these works to be saved. But that's not true. But the saved do these works. Right? Now, you can't save the whole world. But the Holy Spirit will lead you to the ministry and the mission that he's called you to do. And I can tell you this. If it's void of anything, any of this activity, you really need to get right with the Lord. If it's completely void of any of these kind of things. So it, it's not that work saves us. And, and let me explain that real quick, right? Let's go and answer the second question. What makes eternal life impossible? What makes eternal life impossible? The key to this answer, go back to Luke 10, lies in the response of this lawyer. He says, after Jesus told him he was right about loving your, the Lord and your neighbor. Do this, Jesus said, you will live. Verse 29, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, who's my neighbor? So let's get technical. Let's kind of see. And here's the thing, right? If you are trusting in your obedience to the law, which is very clear that in order to have eternal life according to the law is that you better keep all of them. You better keep the law your whole life. It's the minimum standard for eternal life. And if you're going to trust the law, if you're going to trust works, then you better check off all the boxes. Jesus is evangelizing him because the problem is sometimes the reason people don't bend their knees to Christ is they don't realize their wretched condition. He's a biblical man. He's, he's supposed to be the man of God. And Jesus is pointing out, you are desperate above everyone because there are people coming and believing in me and receiving me, but you, the so-called godly one, are in the most desperate case because you're relying on yourself to justify yourself with works. And he's like, he's in a major conundrum. How do I? He's seeking to justify himself. Don't you know the gospel? comes against religion. Don't you know that the gospel is the greatest news because you're trying to earn salvation maybe? Maybe you're here you are. Maybe most of you are already Christians. You already realize it's great news because I knew deep inside that I was trying to obey all the rules and I knew if I was honest with myself that I really wasn't. So I'm in trouble. But listen, that's where the gospel comes in. Because we need this good news. So Jesus is bringing him. Amen. Come on to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right? Jesus is, he's in a process. He's at the bad news process. You have to understand the bad news of where you are if you are rejecting Jesus to be that Savior. Because he is the one who met all the rules. He was perfect in all of his ways. He stood in our place. He stood in our gap. He represented all of humanity. God expected that mankind would live according to the rules, but he knew that we broke them. So God was not done with us. No, he did the most radical 
expression of love that he could ever do. And he sent his own, very own son. I have three sons. I would not want to give my sons as a sacrifice to a sinful, wretched world. But God did. Because he loved you. He loved you. He loved you. He loved all of us. And so we need to come to the understanding that you cannot uh, earn your own righteousness. You can't earn your own salvation. And that's why Jesus loves this man enough to get him to feel all of it. What makes eternal life impossible? Jesus gives a tall order for eternal life. The minimum standard, keep all of the law. What makes eternal life impossible for him is he can't keep it. His motive, motives were wrong. Can I just tell you something? We really should be like this good Samaritan, right? But listen, if you're trying to be that goody two-shoe because of guilt, it's the worst motivator. Like, I really should help that homeless guy who's on the street. I've got a busy schedule. I really should help him. I feel so guilty if I don't. And then you go and do it anyways. Have you ever been, like, in a, somebody doing social justice, maybe feeding the homeless or whatever? Not, not at this church, but I've seen, like, I've been places where they're trying to help people, but the people that are trying to help are miserable. Why? Because they're doing it out of a motivation of guilt. They're like, I have to do this. My conscience is bothering me. But when we come to find out Christ, we do it because it's an overflow of God's love. We see people in a whole different way. I just want to hug so many people. I mean, some people don't want me to hug them. I just love people. I just want to hug people. And I have to put a resistor on there because not everybody wants to be hugged. They think you're crazy, especially in Massachusetts, you know? Like, but I just... It, the, the, the love of God, if you resist showing love to people, think about the love of God has been poured out into your heart. And we're supposed to overflow. It changes everything. You see, what makes eternal life impossible is if you rely upon your own works to save you. Romans 3.20, by, by the works of law, no flesh will be justified. Romans 3.20. Did you see that? How about this one? Romans 3.10. No one is righteous. No, not one. Not a single person is righteous on their own works. So we need help, don't we? And then Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus says this. Matthew 5.20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness, you ready? Surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. What is he saying? He's taking the very top echelon of religious leaders and he's saying, unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because they relied on their own self-justifying works. And Jesus is saying, it won't get you to heaven. But when, oh, I don't want to jump ahead of myself. Here's what we, we see in the story, the priest, the Levite, they failed. And Jesus is speaking to a lawyer. He's in danger of failing the eternal life test. He cares about him. He cares about him. Now then, point number three, what makes eternal life a reality? Jesus points to his big dilemma. Here's what makes eternal life a reality. The only way to life. You ready? When you realize something in this story. This good Samaritan, the man, the Jewish man on the road, Needed the, good, needed the Samaritan man. He was somebody that he would never expect. He was somebody that owed, the Samaritan owed the Jewish guy nothing. It came in a way that you never would realize. You got to remember now, Jesus is teaching this guy. Jesus was the guy that they never wanted or expected. Jesus didn't owe anything. You with me? And so I want us to see something, the real point of the story Jesus wants him to see, I'm the guy that came to you on your road where you've been stripped of your dignity, where sin has beat you up royally, and you had no hope in your own strength. There's nothing you could do to save yourself because your own self-justification will never save you. You needed me. I showed up on that blood pass. And it was through my blood that I was able to save you. And so Jesus comes and he's, he's trying to get this guy to see it. 
because it says in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works because you would boast about it and God does everything he does for his own glory. He saves you for his glory. He does all that he does for his glory. And then Romans 8, 3 says, for, the, for what the law, Romans 8, 3, what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. What the law can't do, God did. How did he do it? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. What you can't do, God took care of it because he loves you. You can't, you can't love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all the time. He knows that. You can't love your neighbor as yourself all the time. He knows that. But listen, watch this. What if you're that person on the road? By the way, just, just hold up for one second. Jesus was saying, you're the Jewish guy on the road that needs salvation. It comes in a way and a person you never expected. The law can't save because you can't keep it. You need a good Samaritan. I am him. So what if you're the person on the road and you know I can't get to heaven unless I get help? Jesus is like saying, it's me and I love you this much. I love you that much. If you come to me, you're going to have a transformed heart because nobody has loved you like this, but Jesus has. And if you come to him and get a transformed heart, guess what? That love that he poured out to you is going to be a love that you want to pour out to other people. Therefore, the motivation will not be guilt or pride. It will be pure love. <laughs> You're just going to start. You just start thinking about, just thinking about, marinate on it. Oh, he loves me that much. I'm so loved. You should just walk around saying, I'm so loved. No, no, no. None of this, none of this like self be beating. Stop beating yourself up. Stop it. It's an insult to the very God who saw you as precious and worth, valuable enough to die on a cross. Instead, you should say, I am so loved. It's not pride. It's not arrogance. It's truth. I'm so loved. I am, oh, I am so incredibly loved by a God. Whoa, does that bring a confidence and a humility? Because you can't do it. Only you had to, you had to trust that Jesus would. And it makes us, the last point, uh, this makes radical love possible. Paul, could you come up, Paul Gerchens? Paul, Ryan. Um, Gail and I ponder and think about how much God loves us. We try to do that. When we stray, we come back. But it helps us to do things that we otherwise wouldn't do. Not from a heart of guilt, but from a heart of love. So years ago, this is Paul. Everybody say hi, Paul. Years ago, when the triplets were nine, uh, we knew that, that Paul, he, he was in the foster care system, and he needed a family. And we already had triplets. We had five kids. But we knew Paul. We said, how could we not? Because he, he also was part of uh, uh, the Jacobs family before that. How could we not bring him into our lives? You know, was it a risk? Absolutely. Did it cost? Absolutely. Did it change our life? Absolutely. But... God poured such a love in our heart for Paul because Paul's an awesome young man. So I went from having triplets to having quads in our house. I mean, we had literally had a room with two bunk beds and we had four boys, wild as anything in there. Paul, you were wild just like the rest of them. We had this um, thing in our doorway. It was a, a pull-up bar. And the boys, you know, would jump on it. Paul was shorter. So he would every day try to get there, <laughs> just come about an inch short. And I kept saying, Paul, you're going to do it someday. You're going to do it someday. And, so, and one day you did it, didn't you? You got to the pull-up bar, right? So, <laughs> so Paul became part of our family, and he still is. He's still part of our family. We stay connected. And um, I remember, Paul, when you came, and you came to the dinner table, and um, Gail had made her quiche, which I love your quiche, Gail. And it gets put out in front of Paul, and he just starts to cry. I'm so sorry. I said, Paul, I'm so sorry. I know, I know you probably don't like Gail's quiche, quiche, even though we do. But it wasn't about the quiche. He was processing that he wasn't with his three other siblings. And he wanted so badly for someone to adopt him and his three siblings, one family, 
So wouldn't we pray? We prayed. Every night. What, what's that? Every night we pray. Every night we prayed that God would find a family that would adopt him and his three, three siblings. And uh, God answered that prayer. A beautiful couple from Situate. Beautiful couple from Situate. Um, they adopted all, all of them, and they have loved them, and we've stayed connected. And I remember the day that we went to the courthouse when you were adopted, and I told the story about praying for this moment. And you were there, bucket of tears, which got me crying. God answers prayer. But the, Paul, I wanted Paul to come, and he wanted to come because eternal lifers, you know what we do? We love people. We love people. Hey, listen, it'll, it'll cost us. There'll be great sacrifice. It takes your time, your energy, all kinds of stuff. But it's worth it. Gail, I think it was in the minivan. Remember we had a minivan where you led Paul to Jesus. Is that right? And I got to baptize him. You know what he's doing now? At his church, in, is it situate, right? Where you go to church? He's teaching youth about the Bible. He's spreading the good news. He's spreading the good news. And he agreed that he wants to represent an advocate. He wants to be an advocate in this moment for anyone that might be contemplating because there's so many kids in the foster care system that need good people with integrity and love. And I challenge you, my daughter, she, she fostered Alexa for many years, her and her husband, and now they've adopted her. But I challenge you. Get your life, ruin your life a little bit because the joy that we have experienced knowing you, Paul, far outweighs anything that cost us or changed our life because you have added so much to our lives and we love you so much. Can we pray for Paul right now? Lord, we thank you for Paul. Thank you for his precious mom and dad, his family. We pray, God, that you would use Paul, that he could have a torch because he's experienced so much of God's love. Somebody came into his, his road and he's now going into on the road of other people's lives. Help us to be like that. And I pray you would protect him and strengthen him and use him and give him courage and help him to step into the life that you have for him. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you so much, Paul. He'll be up here if you want to give him a hug. Um, <laughs> um, please. Get a card. This is, our, this is our summer challenge. This is what we're doing as a church. It's called You Are Loved. Find a way to go love somebody in random acts of kindness. Do something. Help them. Maybe whatever. I'll let you think of the ideas. And whatever ideas you have, please go to our Facebook page. Hashtag You Are Loved. And tell the stories. Tell us your ideas. Can we do that? Grab a card from the ushers back there. There'll be these, these cards. Give, don't give somebody a card unless you show them some way to express God's love because we got to spread this out. We're praying. We're caring. Next week, I'm gonna t we're going to talk about how you can actually share the message of Christ. But they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Can we do this together? Can we do this together? Can we do this together? Let's go do it. I am sending you into your sphere of influence, into your neighborhoods, into your communities, into your workplaces, into the, into the restaurants, at to the gas stations. As you intersect with people, I am sending you to go. Jesus is sending you to go. And go let people know that they are loved, not just with words, but with acts of kindness. God bless you. If you need prayer, we'll be right up here. God bless you. Have a great week.